illumines advanced in all the forms of alchemy and Rosicrucianism and philosophy and mysticism only as the result of internal growth. <coughs> they grew from within themselves only. Their source of inspiration was within their own hearts. They were the heart enlightened ones and their authority came from the depths of their own natures. This was recognized as a major department of the instructed. Among the most important, of course, of the Illumines was Socrates, who was self-initiated. That is, that he became aware through inward contemplation of the teachings and doctrines normally communicated by the mysteries. Because he was not an initiate, he was not uh, forbidden to speak. But discretion again governed these people as in most other levels of mystical insight. Secrecy was not uh, for the purpose of withholding knowledge. It was the protection of knowledge. And those who were self-initiated also were required to protect the sources of their instruction. Another famous illumin uh, was St. Francis. Again, another was the famous German mystic Bemi. These people grew from within the seeds of their own consciousness. And today, this is regarded as a valid form of instruction. And it is valid because, for the most part, the modern truth seeker has to belong to this classification. He has to find his way, not through the official assistance of the state, as in antiquity, but as a result of the contrition, as a result of the dedication and the mystical insights that develop within himself. The Illumin was usually an individual who passed through an initiational ceremony in his personal life. In other words, his life became his initiation. He faced the problems of daily living. He was often under very heavy burden of stress and pain and sorrow. Very frequently his life was tragic, but these were the testings of his own spirit. And those who survived, and most of them did of course, were finally rewarded by a consolation of spirit arising within their own natures. This is where the average person of today finds himself in connection with his search for truth. The secular arts and sciences are well classified. If we wish to hire an attorney or a physician, we can get a resume, find the qualifications, and decide whether or not the person has the background we require. But in philosophical and religious matters, it is much more difficult. It is very hard to find uh, a well-organized program by means of which an individual can advance his own spiritual convictions. Therefore, in most cases, the person has to work it out for himself. In so doing, he gains. He gains much more, probably, because it is much more important to us to learn through doing than to having someone tell us. But in these problems, there are certain difficulties arise also, one of which is discrimination. It is not easy for the average person to discriminate his own feelings. It is not very easy for him to estimate his own inner experiences and say these are genuine and these are not. It is very hard for the person to judge critically his own accomplishments. He is so desirous of believing that all is well or that he is growing rapidly or that everything is fine that he lacks discrimination, discretion, and careful thinking. Now, one of the problems that faces um, most of the people who are now working with religious matters is that while the orthodox denominations are fairly well integrated, those that are outside the fields of orthodoxy still remain a kind of strange, dim confusion. There are many able and dedicated people in the field their findings do not necessarily uh, synchronize. 
the uh, sincere individuals come to different conclusions, different attitudes, and have different points of view. And the novice starting out has great trouble trying to discover an approach to the needs of his own life, an approach that is secure and sound. The uh, real answer to all of these situations, of course, is that the mind itself, the judging instrument, the protecting power in the life of each person must be able to handle the situation. And usually it is not. Sometimes it can handle in part, but not entirely. Now the purpose of the mind, as far as protecting us is concerned, is to weed out things that are of their own nature and kind, doubtful, uncertain, conflicting, contradictory. And yet, uh, we, we don't generally use the mind in this way. We are much more likely to use it to support whatever dominant interest we have at the moment. If we are sold on something, the mind helps to keep us sold and does not cooperate for us with us in order to find out the real basic facts involved. Now, in mysticism, which by its very nature implies mystery, we have a factor that is very difficult to work with, and that is the unknown. <coughs> we have to work with the mysterious. And in so doing, we have to try to remove the mystery factor, because no one really functions well in the presence of the unknown. When we do not understand, superstitions increase, misinterpretations abound, and the individual can go off on side tracks and never return. So it is necessary to try, first of all, to get rid of unknown factors. Now, in a student-teacher relationship, it is very important that the teacher defends the right of the student to know the facts involved. The uh, surrounding of facts with mysteries in order to bolster up uncertainties is wrong. If a certain teaching is pronounced by a teacher, the pupil has a perfect right to say, where did it come from? Who is responsible for this teaching? When did it begin? How does it prove itself in daily life? And where a difficult, mysterious, or secret instruction is involved, the teacher must be in a position uh, to tell the simple facts of life to the, to the student. And if the teacher says that he is bound by obligation not to tell, then he, by the same rule, should be bound in obligation not to bring up the subject. In other words, stay with what he can explain, what he can tell, what he can do, and never uh, put on an air of mystery and say that these things are just too deep for common understanding. If they're too deep to be understood, they're too deep to be mentioned. Now, this problem is quite common in the field, that the individual uh, has uh, some feelings about the possibility of adding a depth or dimension of importance to a subject by mystery. Avoid it. Avoid trying to do it yourself. If someone asks you a question, in connection with philosophy or with religion, do not take the attitude, well, that will be revealed in one of the higher grades. Either answer the question or else prove conclusively at the point where the information comes from. Mysterious implications are floating around these days by the thousand, and they are not good. They demoralize and disintegrate the defense mechanism of the individual against imposture. Now, it isn't always actually imposture. But, uh, for instance, uh, we can say to someone, where did you get this idea from? What, where is the source of this instruction? Now, there can be a mysterious thing involved, or we can come out frankly and say, well, it began with a, a dream experience. I had an inner experience, and this is what it was. And this is what I believe it means. But because of the fact that it is an experience that came to me uniquely, 
and for which I have no uh, official support other than the experience itself, the individual who listens to it has a right to make his own findings, to decide for himself whether he considers it adequate and or proper or well enough authenticated. Now, for the most part, this type of thing is not necessary because nearly every idea that we have in the field of religious philosophy is old. There is very, very little that is essentially new. Practically every concept that is necessary to help the individual to live to better today has been available for thousands of years. It isn't the absence of ideas that has resulted in the difficulties we face. It's the fact that the average person is not sufficiently interested in the solution of problems. What the average person wants is to do as little as possible and enjoy life as far as he can. He doesn't want to take on discrimination or does not wish to discipline his own appetites. And because of lack of discipline, he is unable to judge the values involved in a religious decision. Everything we need for daily growth is available. It's available, practically all of it, in solid print somewhere. It is available in great classic texts. It is available in the writings of the world teachers. It is available in traditions that have descended for thousands of years and been held in the highest veneration. There is nothing more that is necessary in the form of mystery. Now, it is true, beyond all doubt, as, for example, in the word mystery, when we look it up in the dictionary, the word mystery has as its first meaning religion. Today our idea of mystery is more apt to be a mystery story or a detective play. But the original meaning of the word mystery is a sacred rite. And the uh, most frequently referred to mystery in Christianity is the Eucharist. Mystery, therefore, is actually a spiritual experience. It is not a secret thing. It is a spiritual involvement in the common affairs of living. And uh, the individual does not, uh, as a result of, of mystery, come into something that is unknowable or unknown. It is something, however, that is a spiritual revelation based in deity. And in, in this sense of the word, uh, we cannot go any further. The abstract mystery of re uh, regeneration, redemption, these things rest in the substance of deity. This we cannot hope to explain or define other than in terms of interpretation. But there is no essential reason why these things cannot be forthrightly and practically discussed. What we have to try to do is to realize that when someone in the midstream of life suddenly becomes involved in the experience of a religious need, suddenly comes upon a way of life religiously that is different from what they have previously known. And they find this new way of life helpful, useful, solutional, inspiring, and constructive. They nearly always want to share this knowledge with other people. <coughs> this is perfectly normal and natural. In order to share this knowledge, it becomes necessary for the newly acquired knowledge to be analyzed, dissected, and, dis and digested by the person to whom it is given. Someone comes along and over the back fence and ha says, I've just read a book that's just wonderful. You should read it. Well, so the book is handed over the fence and a line of belief is transmitted. Now, what this belief is, the man who hands the book over the fence may not know, and the one who receives it knows less. But it is something that seems to inspire, seems to help, seems to give justification or support in the problems of life. And today especially, we are all reaching out for this type of support. We are all experiencing the need of inspiration, of encouragement, and of some type of vital doctrine to give us new securities within our own nature. Paul was right beyond all question when he pointed out that there is only finally one security, and that is the security of faith. The final answer to all the questions relating to man's spiritual experience must be faith. 
faith in the reality of things unseen. Faith in the existence of something superior to the problem which we now face. Faith in future, faith in self, faith in loved ones, faith in nations and in the world. Everywhere there must be a faith upon which to build. But faith, unfortunately, has to be supported in some way. Faith floating in the air doesn't seem to do very well. Faith is not only a problem of a belief in realities. Faith is an ability, in a sense at least, to rationalize realities. Let us take an example of a person such as Plato. Uh, Plato was essentially a philosopher. But like most philosophers, he discovered in the course of time that philosophy is a rather dry, dusty subject. He found that he could study philosophy all he wanted to and come to some tremendously vibrant, vital, practical conclusions. And yet philosophy didn't have give all the answers. What philosophy did give him was the power to discriminate. Philosophy helped him to organize common sense. Philosophy was actually disciplined common sense. In some mysterious way, philosophy helps to prevent the mind from going off the deep end. It helps the individual to think things through. It helps the individual to weigh values, to determine what is honest, what is not honest, to decide for himself the results of cause and effect in their pattern sequences in his own living. So philosophy gives the person a discriminating point of view. Having achieved this, having come to a certain realization of what is fair, what is just, what is honest, what is honorable, then the individual can project these concepts toward the abstraction of faith. Faith is more or less the individual's heart supported by the findings of his mind. Faith is a direct experience of believing, but faith is made uh, content or made rational through organizing mental resources. So wherever there is a faith, we have to build something under it. And whether we realize it or not, we drift inevitably towards philosophy, because philosophy is trying to help us to supply a rational point of view. It is helping us to prove, for example, that God is absolutely necessary. Faith is the recognition of a divine principle. But the individual can say, I can be an atheist or an agnostic, I can accept or I can reject. Philosophy says, no, you can't. Philosophy tells us that if you think it through, you have to come to faith. If you think through the creation, you have to face the creator. If you think through the laws of nature, you have to find the lawmaker. So that the mind disciplining belief prepares the way to support the highest of all faith, and that is faith in the absolute perfection of the divine purpose. Now, when we start out trying to help people with problems, we have to try to find ways in which we can share beliefs that are valuable to us and at the same time not subject the listener to difficulties. <coughs> it is a mistake to assume that knowledge is transmitted finally through words. It is not. The knowledge is transmitted through insights which have to be developed within the person themselves. So whenever a new student or a new person becomes interested in the involvements of a philosophic life, it is very important that the teacher, whoever it may be, begins on the level of deportment. Now this is where most teachers do not begin and that they find it too discouraging if they do. The moment you tell an individual that he has to change himself in some way, you're apt to lose a disciple. <coughs> he wants to remain as he is and be better at the same time. He wants to recover from all of the sorrows of ignorance, but he wants to remain ignorant. 
Now, this point of view has to be faced whenever you attempt to communicate knowledge. Knowledge has to be communicated on a progressive basis. The individual has to learn that he has to grow, and that knowledge that does not support growth or growth that is not supported by knowledge is, is not valuable. So when the time comes to try to inspire a person, you have to begin with what is commonly called the cathartic, cathartic methods of discipline. These were the ancient Greek mysteries of the uh, ancient temple rites. The first thing you have to say to the individual, or try to convince the individual, is that if he wishes to become better, he must outgrow those parts of himself which are preventing him from being better. It is not that we pass on the cosmic law, the universal harmony, and infinite uh, providence and plenty. It is, is the individual ready or willing to make the changes in his own inner life which will make growth possible? If he is not so conditioned, he will become simply an intellectualist. He will have a lot of answers, but he will not be able to apply them to himself. He will be able to discuss all these principles, but they move across the surface of his own life with practically no effect upon him. He can believe in reincarnation for a lifetime, discuss it, try to convert other people to it, but never live as though it meant anything to him never becomes part of a d determination to change his own policies, to deserve a better embodiment. To a deserve a better embodiment is the primary end of the doctrine. If the individual learns the doctrine but does not change himself, uh, the fact that he has learned it will not provide him with the better embodiment that he's looking for. He must make everything that he learns means something in his own daily conduct. He must grow constantly in grace of spirit. He must do the things that he believes. If he does this because it's consistently with a little quiet leadership, he will gradually reach a point where he can experience some of the transformations referred to in the matter of illumination. These transformations arise when the person changes his own orientation. He cannot remain as he is and be different. And the only way he can grow or outgrow a problem is to become a solver of that problem, never to escape it, never to avoid it. <coughs> it is useless for him to try to mentally cast off the problem as long as he doesn't solve it in his own life. So when you start out on yourself or anyone else in matter of teaching, make sure that every new idea that comes into your consciousness produces a change in conduct. Let it be, if possible, a gradual improvement of the whole nature. Now, most persons starting out in these fields, in middle life especially, come to philosophy or idealism or mysticism because of difficulties. They are sad, they are burdened, they are sick, they have broken homes and wayward children, they have all kinds of difficulties, financial, personal, psychological, emotional, mental, and occasionally serious physical ailments. These people are therefore looking for something more than they have previously had in the form of insights. They are looking for some way to straighten themselves out. Now, they may not put it quite so clearly as that. What they are really saying to themselves probably is that they want to know something that will, <coughs> that will change these problems. They don't want to change themselves primarily, but it gradually becomes evident that they will have to. But having decided to try to find a better answer to the problem of life, then, of course, as we have always pointed out, the first thing you have to do is take the personal inventory. What is the matter? Now, the average personal inventory consists principally 
of trying to prove why other people are responsible for our miseries. <laughs> it's surprising how few people have ever done anything wrong themselves. They're all victims. <coughs> well, a lot of people are victims, let's face it. As particularly, they are victims of social problems, of the tremendous shifts and change and crises and world events. They are in trouble, and at the first look, it doesn't seem as though it's all their own fault. In some cases, it uh, looks a little that way, but in some instances, there seem to be legitimate excuses. But the only excuses that are uh, legitimate at all are those which arise from natural ignorance. The individual who doesn't know any better is apt to be in certain troubles. But if he doesn't know, know more and learn to know better, he will stay in those problems. So he can start in to find out what his own resources are. He'll try to discover just what kind of a person he is. And sometimes one of the best ways to try to figure that out is to do what the Pythagorean disciplines did, cause the individual to go back over his life in reverse and see exactly the effects of the various causations for which he was responsible. The individual who bought that uh, non-existing stock because he thought he was going to make 25% premium a year on it and resulted in loss of everything, was responsible. He wanted an unreasonable profit, so he lost. If he had been conservative and practical, he might have been all right. But in his greed, he destroyed himself. And time after time, the mistakes that we make ourselves become our own undoing usually because of ulterior motive, usually because we have got some kind of a little conspiracy in the back of our mind somewhere, or because of some desire to notoriety or fame or distinction or wealth or something. So we have to start in by going over these and finding out what the troubles are. It gradually becomes evident, as was taught in the Greek mysteries, that a certain purging is, is indicated. You have to clean up the life. You have to get rid of those elements in the life which are not worthy of you. You have to get rid of those endless arguments and dissensions, those bad spells of disposition, the temper fits and the hysterias and the gloom and the blames, and we have to get over living in the past. I know an individual who has been living in the past every day for the most of the present lifetime, and yet the one thing they're grateful for is that they don't live in the past. They don't even know it. So you have to wake up to some of these facts. You have to wake up to the fact that old grievances are still working. And you are looking for knowledge. You are looking for understanding, for insight. You are looking for faith and hope and love. You are looking for to be a better person. And you have to get over yourself as a stumbling block. So that is where all instruction has to start. The individual doesn't have to wait until he's reformed before he tries to learn anything. But he should make a voluntary obligation to himself that with every new idea that he gets, with every new interpretation of life, he is going to correct a personal fault. If he will do that, he will find his growth is much more rapid. Now, some people are placed in positions where it doesn't seem possible for them to per perhaps to correct these faults very rapidly. Situations are dominating their lives and they cannot resist the pressures of them. But there is another angle to this also. <coughs> it is possible very often uh, to reduce and simplify life. Most people are too complicated. They're also too much set in ancient ways. One thing many people will have to do probably is to reevaluate uh, what life has already meant to them. If a person reaches 50 or 60 uh, with a certain life pattern, one of two things must happen. Either they're going to carry that pattern to the grave with them, which is the line of least resistance, or they're going to make a very severe and hard effort to break it and start out on a new pattern while it's still possible to do something with it. Wherever a pattern 
that brought a person to middle life discontented, unhappy, unadjusted, insecure, and frightened, that pattern has to be changed. If it isn't changed, they will go out of this world into the next life frightened to death. So that uh, the uh, problem is to take your philosophy, if you've got an idea, to do something with it and do it now, and use it, and make something out of it. So with that point in mind, you now turn on the philosophy for a moment and see what this particular idea that you're interested in is going to do for you. If this idea is going to simply enable you to accomplish what is accredited of St. Thomas Aquinas, namely as a result of great meditation, he was able to count the number of angels that could dance on the head of a pin. If this is this type of instruction, I'd forget about it. You're not here to find out why something on some other planet somewhere else is better off than we are. We're not here to dream of utopian escapes out of this world. We're not here to work with subjects which, after we've learned them, leave us exactly what we were before. We can learn all about the mysteries of the universe and still remain tired, disconnected, discontented people. So whatever you're going to take on has got to have utility. It's got to have value right now. It's got to do something for you with the problems you face today. It is not uh, the type of thing in which you can afford to follow a belief that is going to make things marvelous for you 10,000 years from now. You have to start now. So whatever you're studying must help to make you the person you must be to solve your own problem. So you can re remember that these, some of these byways are perfectly fascinating. You can learn more and more about it, less and less, until, as Albert Hubbard said, you know all about nothing. The, uh, some of these philosophies and the beliefs are charming. And if the individual is happy, well-adjusted, and likes to have a little recreational reading, fine. You can have a lot of pleasure with it. But you have to have something that gets at the facts. The facts right now. And these facts are that you must improve your personal relationships with life. Now, how do we improve personal relationships with life? First of all, we have to take on an attitude which nearly all great religious systems have affirmed, namely that we are here to learn. We are here to grow. We are here to do something. We are not here to float around on flowery beds of ease. We are not here for the gay life or for the wealthy life or for lack of responsibility or to spend all of our time in leisure and dissipation. We are here to learn something. And until that becomes a basic part of our commitment, we are not going to get out of this problem what we should. So if we will remember that we are here to be better every day in actual, factual growth, that we are a little more honest every day, a little more kind every day, that we have better control of our tongues, that we have better discipline in our relations with life, that we use our funds better, that we take better care of all responsibilities that come along, and that less and less are we concerned with the primary satisfactions of our own desires. Gradually, we get into harmony with the law of living. And when we do that, then we begin to see how we can grow and teach and become helpful to other people. So the catharsis should come first. Any individual who wants to grow should be assisted or directed in preparing a plan for growth. And this plan should not be to make life easier. It's to make life better with the realization that in the end, in the long run, the better life will be the easier. But in the meantime, it may require considerable discipline and some self-sacrifice to make it work. So in the next uh, point that we want to try to bring up is the relationship as it was found in the Orient between a teacher and a disciple. 
This is a very uh, touchy situation, especially in the West. Because in the West, we do not believe in anybody obeying anything. The individual wishes to do precisely as he pleases. To us, freedom is the right to make mistakes. And if anyone tries to prevent us from making mistakes, we get real surly about it. We're not very happy. We do not recognize that freedom is the right to be right, and that freedom is also the possibility of being right regardless of circumstances. So uh, instead of following the old Oriental pattern of learning to uh, lead by following, we want to start by leading. We want to begin where discipline really should be in midstream rather than to start at the beginning. The old Indian guru system was based upon the individual learning to obey on different levels. And the learning to obey was a quiet method of getting over self-will. In the old uh, Babylonian Talmud it said, self-will was the cause of the fall of the angels. Self-will is, I will do as I please. And the only way you can get over that is to discipline it. And in the Indian system of education, the discipline began with the gurus. The guru is an elderly gentleman. He'd be the last person in the world to tell you that he was divine. He wasn't. He was a kind of philosophic parent trying to do what most parents do not try to do, and that is to truly mature their children. The old guru was uh, a mentor. The disciples lived with him over periods of years, worked with him every day, and in every instance his will was law. No one would have thought of crossing him. No one would have disobeyed him on any account because he became a symbol of discipline. When the disciple became wiser than the teacher, he went to another and more advanced teacher. But the teacher did not try to run his life simply because he could get away with it. Uh, the teacher was there to make certain that the disciple in all things was obedient first to his teacher second to the laws of the universe, and third to God. These obediences were necessary. Without them there could be no growth. So today, when the person learns something of a, of an, of a nature more advanced than the commonplace, he has the problem of being obedient to it. He has, a, he has the right and necessity to obey truth as it is given to him to understand truth. If truth says, Thou shalt not steal, he will not steal. If the truth says, Thou shalt love thine enemy, he will love him, because this is obedience to a law bigger than personal feelings. And until we outgrow the personal feelings, we will never experience the divine feelings. So in each instance, the individual is moving towards obedience to higher convictions of life. And in so doing, he is gradually enlightening, broadening, deepening the foundations of his own integrity. And having come to a certain degree of integrity, he is then in a position to make decisions that are completely impersonal, completely fair, completely just, and completely good. Until he is able to make these decisions, he cannot go on to a higher level of insight. So we have to try to bear in mind that with all the studying that we do, that we mustn't simply assume that we can read our way into nirvana. We must take thoughts and make these thoughts where we understand them and believe them an essential part of our own instruction. There are many very lovely and beautiful little books that have been written, like Thoreau's Walden and some of these books, that have wonderful messages in them for simple people 
who are willing to live their, the dignity of their own simple life. There are beautiful thoughts for all of us that will enrich us and ennoble us. But when we find a beautiful thought, it's not enough to memorize it or to say how wonderful it is. We must immediately put it to work. It must mean something right now. If we are able to apply these beautiful thoughts as we are capable of understanding them, gradually we will modify and uh, contain uh, the pressures within ourselves with greater dignity. Having reached a point in which there is no longer conflict between what we want and what we need, we are coming very close to the entrance to the sanctuary. We are coming very close to that condition in which it is going to be possible for us uh, to uh, go on into the more positive forms of discipline beyond what we are doing at the moment. Having gone through the pur purging problem, the, the purification problem, the individual enters the sanctuary for the next step, and this next step is dedication. Having prepared the body, the mind, the personality for service, having dedicated the life to the service of good, of truth, of deity, and of our fellow human being, we are then ready to go on and prepare for the ministry that we may have, whatever it may be. So the second or higher right degrees of these rites had to do with the basic instruction which could be communicated and which would assist the individual to live the good life. It becomes a matter in which the person no longer lives for himself. He becomes truly the pen in the hand of the ready writer. He becomes an instrument of the universal purpose <coughs> with no desire to be anything else. Now, in doing this, however, we mustn't assume that he necessarily goes off into the wilderness somewhere and uh, becomes uh, a hopeless ascetic or someone who has given up all contact with life. This is not it. The answer is that the individual has become dedicated to the doing of that which is the best he knows, and that in this procedure he will try to serve others in the capacities that are within his own means. Now, in India and many of these other foreign countries, capacities are determined very largely by background skills. Supposing we say that an individual has become a physician, and as a physician he has then gone on and become a disciple of some Indian teacher. Or perhaps he became a physician, like in my little story of the guru, uh, because that was what his teacher wanted him to be. And, of course, his teacher's word was law. But anyway, this man has become a physician, and he is now a disciple of a school. He is part of a hierarchy of the guru's structure, as it is in India. Immediately it becomes obvious that regardless of anything, any circumstance that may arise, selfishness has died in that doctor. Abuse of any privilege is impossible. Exploitation of his profession is impossible. The neglect of the sick because the sick are poor is impossible. Everything is now tied around a pivot of integrity. And whatever that profession may be, it must be always honorable, completely and formally in integrities alone. That is impossible that anything should be compromised. I know even years ago, uh, in traveling in Japan, in one place where I was, I threw away a pair of shoes, dropped it in the wastebasket, didn't want them any longer. Those shoes followed me all over the Japanese Empire. I couldn't get rid of them. Each hotel I came to, the shoes were waiting for me. You could take a pocketbook or a wallet with a lot of money in it, lay it on the edge of a desk somewhere and go away for a week. When you came back, it would be there. Why? Because the proprietor was an armidist. 
He was dedicated. Now, this dedication didn't may prevent him from being a good proprietor or making a reasonable living, but he would not touch anything that was not his own. Now, these are the integrities of discipleship, and they must be present if the individual wishes to transform theoretical knowledge into spiritual experience. These changes have to come as a result of growth inside the person. And when that growth comes, it doesn't make very much difference whether there are any schools available or not. The whole growth takes place inside the person. Once his dedication uh, to an idea that is bigger than he previously had is firmly established and he lives it, he grows as nature grows. He grows like the lily of the field and the rose of Sharon. He grows because growth is natural to all that lives. It is human sophistication that blocks growth and transforms a beautiful experience into a deadly monotony of careers. So each person has this parallel job to take care of. He can read all the texts he wants to and find out all about the great mysteries of existence. But the only thing that can help him to solve his problem is to work upon the inconsistencies and intemperances of his own nature. Actually, if he begins this procedure, he finds out that it has a tremendous therapy. When it comes to discipline, the hardest step is the first one, because the first one has to be taken on faith. You say, if I, you say to yourself, if you're going to do it better, you're going to hope that something good will happen. This you have to take on faith. But the moment you have made the first step, the effects begin to develop themselves. In a very short time, you begin to realize that instead of being one of the most difficult decisions to make, the dedication is the easiest, and its results are most Im immediately apparent and enduring. In a very short time, discipline can affect every phase of your life constructively. It can bring better health, it can bring peace to the home. It can relieve you from dissensions in business. It can get away from all the intemperances and problems of political structures today. <coughs> A little discipline, and you begin to digest better. You sleep better. You're also more moderate in your desires. You do not have the tendency to go in debt. We now have a very large, difficult situation of the abuse of credit cards. The individual thinks he has money in the bank as long as he has a credit card. This wouldn't happen with a good yoga background, because no yogi would use a credit card that way. In fact, he probably wouldn't use one at all because there's nothing he needs. But presuming that you are a disciplined person, you can use all of these privileges and make life a little simpler and easier. But without discipline, everything is perverted. And without uh, the gradual discipline, the wisdom of life itself has no chance of taking over. You cannot do the things that are necessary to be done. Another important point about discipline that I think is very, uh, in, uh, very valuable is that whereas we think very largely of discipline as a specialized skill, that actually discipline is by far less intensely specialized than most of our career problem, problems. Discipline doesn't mean that you can only do one thing. And as a result of being tied up with a monorail type of consciousness and with life is centered upon one thing alone, uh, you get intensity, but you do not get discipline. Discipline is something that can be transferred from one object to another almost instantly and be equally valuable in all relationships. Discipline can make you work harder when you're working. It can make you rest better when you rest. It can prevent you from becoming so one-pointed that you lose interest in everything else in life. It helps you to escape from the tremendous pressures of career, which have a tendency to narrow and limit everything that you do. Discipline tells you when to pick up the career and when to lay it down. Discipline will prevent you from bringing the job home. 
It will enable you to solve it where it should be solved. Little by little, discipline enlarges your foundation. It gives you time and skills for art, for music, for every type of thing. But always, wherever you have a skill, you have a discipline. And where the greatest of all disciplines is the discipline of, love, of living, then you have the greatest of all skills. If then you are really interested, then I think one of the things to do for everyone is to begin with a very simple understanding. If you are in doubt and you do not know just exactly what to do about some of these things, uh, then probably start with something like the Sermon on the Mount or with the uh, various words of Christ as recorded in the New Testament. Simple admonitions to love one another and work with them until you've solved them. <coughs> Remember that the meek are the blessed, for they shall inherit the earth. Get away from the false sophistications of things. Take the simple facts of life. That if you cannot love your brother whom you have seen, you cannot love your God whom you have not seen. And many people who come not speaking with their brother at all are quite certain they're deeply in love with God. They haven't learned the lesson. They haven't picked it up at all. So take the simple things first. I saw a little note in the paper not long ago that I thought was rather cute. And that is that it has taken 35 million laws to enforce the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and it's still not enforced. <laughs> Just imagine what would happen if the average person simply settled down quietly and said, I don't care what's on the books. I believe in the Ten Commandments and I'm going to live them. It would change the whole destiny of the world. But it would interfere to a certain degree with a lot of personal ambitions. It, it, it doesn't sound very spiritual. That's another problem we have. Things have to sound spiritual, whether they are or not. If they're glamorous, they sound spiritual. And if they're not glamorous, they sound more like hard work. Well, growing is hard work. And always will be. But it's very rewarding work. It's like a farmer with a good field. It takes a lot of work to bring in the harvest, but it's a good harvest if any brings it in. Everywhere in this uh, problem, we have the constant need for getting down to the simple, direct practices of the, pr of the principles of integrity. Now, we don't have to read great, long, elaborate treatises to find out what these integrities are. They are practically written in the air. They're in the sky. They're everywhere. But once we have gotten to love them, and have gotten to understand them and stand with them, once we have become associated vitally with them, our entire relationships with life change. Then if we want to go on, there are all kinds of ways in which we can expand knowledge and do new things and involve new uh, projects. And there's also the final work that the teacher has to do, and that is to take the understanding that he has and uh, help to apply it to the problems of those who come for help. <coughs> he has to try to show what is necessary. And he will have to show by very simple means that the individual must keep the rules if he wants to get the results. I knew an old doctor who was a very uh, fine old man. He was a very sincere physician, one of the old, old school. So he said, uh, went to me one day, he said, man comes to me, he's got a stomachache. I said to him, George, you know why you have that stomachache. He says, yes, I guess I do. You don't eat right. You don't think right. You don't live right. How do you expect your digestion to be any good? Yes, I guess there's some truth in that. So I'm going a little further. The man says to him, well, Doc, I, uh, can't you give me a little something for that stomachache? A little baking soda, maybe? The doctor says, yes. You'll be back next week with a stomachache again. 
that you don't want to get well. All you want to do is to have your stop, stomach stop telling you what's wrong with you. That's what it is. It's just the problem of the individual doesn't really want to change. He wants to do as he pleases and escape the consequences. This is what has created and maintained and amplified the aspirin industry. Everyone wants to stop hurting, but no one wants to behave. Now, this might sound like a little exaggeration, but it is true in principle, because if we wanted to behave, we would. And religion, philosophy, all these things arise from the common grounds of the individual wanting to improve, to be better, to accomplish more, to be more useful, to be more satisfied with himself, to have a sense of internal dignities and values. These things have to come through discipline. So if someone comes to you and brings their problem, you can probably, after a little while, by looking back on your own life, you can say to this individual, I think I see what the trouble is. Now, I can't cure it for you, but I can tell you what I did for myself with it. Maybe it'll help you too. And try wherever possible to advise what has worked for you. And if you've never tried it yourself, be a little slow to recommend it to somebody else. Especially if you know you should have tried it. So try to always advise from the basis of achieved experience. And if there, your own experience is not quite adequate, then try to gather some other help from sources of similar attitudes and similar concepts. If you want to try to find natural ways of healing, work with natural healing methods and find out, as all do in time, that there are rules governing these things. Now, the, the person who is a spiritually successful person is not one who uh, has accomplished all kinds of outside things. It is the individual who is able to daily maintain serenity of spirit and continued usefulness. Now, another problem we have in this field very often is this lack of usefulness. The individual who sees a little light somewhere wants to sit back and pontificate about it. They want to go and have other people sit and listen to them tell about it. This is not the real answer to the thing at all. If we have a little bit more light, a little bit more of insight than we had before, we must be useful. Too many persons reaching retirement age uh, think of rest as freedom from labor. It is not. The only thing that results from freedom from labor is boredom. What we nearly, what we really need to do is to take the new information that is coming to us and do something with it. Now, we may not always know just what to do. And in a very highly complicated civilization like this, there are many times when it's almost impossible to figure out what we can do, but we must try. And there's always something we can do. Everyone who would become enlightened must become a server. <coughs> they must do something. They must help those in trouble. If all they can do is go next door and help a sick person take care of their house. There's got to be action. There's got to be dedication. And in a sense, our service of others is a penance for our own mistakes. We can and should never try to learn unless learning impels us to help now. Learning that locks us in a room with a book is not the kind of learning we need. The kind of learning is to read one line of the book and go out and work all day. Do something with what we know. Help in some way. Help in uh, helping those who are in trouble. The world is full of problems these days. And each person who grows must at the same time ask very devoutly very simply, very uh, honestly, what can I do with what I'm learning? 
how can I prove my dedication by using what I know for the greater glory of truth? We have to think this at, at this at all times. There must be effort. We cannot simply pile up knowledge in the mind or pile up good feelings in the heart. We've got to do something with them. They've got to go out and serve. They must some way make a better world. And if we can do that, then we will be able to really instruct people in the proper manner. So when you grow, if you are teaching, always find out what the individual is doing to help. Find out what they are doing every day for someone else. What sacrifice they may be making of some time or effort to make life better for someone else. And also, are they growing unselfishly, or are they growing like misers, trying to store up some kind of knowledge that others do not have? Are they trying to develop some kind of a sense of superiority? Does wisdom mean to them a social advancement? Uh, does it mean they become part of a spiritual aristocracy of some kind? If this is the attitude, they've missed the boat entirely. The purpose of it is very definite, that those who would be the greatest among us must be the servants of all. Service is the great keynote for transforming theoretical knowledge into eternal fact. So it is very necessary uh, for the individual, whenever instruction is given, to have a job given with it, something to do. Now, sometimes it may only be that they'll have to try to do something uh, for someone in their family who is in need at that moment. Maybe they can't go out into the larger circle of things. But if there is someone who is unhappy, someone who is in need, someone who is lonely, someone who is neglected, then the person who is growing begins to feel the emotional pull to bring peace and comfort and thought and hope to this other person. Now, it may well be that the other person won't even appreciate it. This is another little trick that has to be considered. But whether the other person appreciates it or not has nothing to do with the case. The problem is that it is our duty to do that which we feel is right. <coughs> if it's rejected, that is the other person's burden. But we do not do it for soap of reward to ourselves or to be patted on the back and told how wonderful we are. We do it because there is a need. And if the person we're doing, for it, doing it for doesn't know that need, that is not our responsibility. It is never permitted uh, that we fail simply because someone else fails us. Everyone can fail us but one, and that is deity, and that cannot fail. Otherwise, we are to serve as it is given to us to see, to do that which we find is useful. Now, when you come to a <coughs> more formal system, people might and probably do want some kind of little simple guidelines to help them in their, in their growing. And working with the problem over the many, many years, I've found that it seems to me that there are two systems, basic systems, that have extraordinary advantages. Now, I've been criticized on a lot of occasions on the grounds that I do not properly emphasize other people's faults. In other words, if I'm interested in someone like Plato, I do not bring out all the possible weaknesses of the man, although I assume them. I don't think it is necessary to go into a deep biographical discussion of the weaning of Plato, or uh, that it was necessary for Plato uh, to have some a complaint while he was an infant. These things don't mean anything. What we do is to pick out the achievements of the person that are most outstanding, and we measure the individual by the best that he was. We assume he's not going to be that good all over. The same is true of all teaching. We can criticize and condemn and turn away from something for some small mistakes. It is said Aristotle never knew how many teeth there were in the human head, but that isn't very much importance. 
The important thing is his great essay on metaphysics, which is one of the best things that the world has ever had. So we take the good, and we don't tear down the individual or try to belittle him, because we're all in the same boat. Now, in, the, in, in studying these things, I have come to the conclusion that, broadly speaking, Neoplatonism, as it developed in Alexandria and Athens, uh, in the perfection of the theology of Plato, the original works having been lost, is probably one of the most important descents of Western mysticism. It is uh, a, a magnificent moral ethical structure with no limitations or restrictions that are obviously difficult. For the Eastern systems, I like Mahayana Buddhism because it represents probably one of the most completely uh, idealistic systems that we have. It is free from most of the confusions and discords that have affected religions from early times. These two systems seem to suggest a, a practical background of self-discipline. Both of these systems emphasize simple living. They reward the journey of the truth seeker in terms of the journey inward to self and to that which lies at the root of life. Both systems emphasize that the source of reality is within us and not on the outside. That the journey is always through the levels of our own limitation to the limitless reality that is at the core. <coughs> we are therefore always on this journey toward the real. And this journey toward the real is through a series of simple renunciations of false values. The gradual, gentle conquest of the mistakes in our own temperaments. The gradual cleansing of the imperfections of mind and heart and body. And the dedication of every resource that we possess uh, to the service of the human need. Now, these simple principles uh, protect us in a great way. Both of these schools were very humble. Neither one of them had any great emphasis upon worldly success. They were not trying to make famous people. They were trying to help average persons uh, to find the eternal verities without which we can never fulfill our destinies. So these two systems have always had a great interest for me philosophically. And between these systems and in other uh, systems brought together, we also come to the principal contribution of Christianity uh, to this system. Christianity is essentially mysticism. Uh, Christianity is an internal experience of the mystery of infinite benevolence. It is the inner experience of the absolute unconditioned love of God for all that exists. And it is to be copied or to be reproduced in human action by the individual loving his neighbor, his brother, and his world. So the direct experience of, of love is a Christian mysticism. The direct experience of enlightened wisdom impelling to love is both Platonic and Buddhistic. Altogether, they form a kind of victorious triumphant of powers through the understanding of which the life of the average individual can be simple and reconciled. These major systems have stood the test of ages. They have stood the uh, problems of centuries. They come down to us with their substances intact. And they also tell us very simply that all wisdom and all the things we are trying to do are summed up in the simple experience of love, the divine love for all that lives. And that's where we truly love, not as personal life, love, which is only an aspect of it, but as a complete love of truth, love of God, love of humanity, love of beauty, love of wisdom, all these unqualified dedications of unselfish love to the objectives of existence. In these areas, we achieve uh, the highest form of mystical insight. There is really no need for mystery. 
There is no need for any kind of strange secrets. The secret thing, of course, if there is a secret, is that the love that we talk about <coughs> in mysticism can only be experienced. It can never be communicated. It is something that can happen, and no one will ever be able to define what happens. But it is a sudden sense of at one month, a sudden sense of complete unification with the infinite benevolence of deity. And moving, living, guiding, hoping in this atmosphere, we go on through life in a very simple and gentle way. And having broken no laws in our own daily conduct, we come, come in the end to release from all of the debtedness with which most persons' lives are burdened. It is a very simple and reasonable way of approaching this problem. And uh, it means that the disciple uh, who wants to learn uh, must try to find the simple uh, contact with the teacher. In the Indian teaching system, the contact is simply that the disciple has genuine sympathy, follows the instructions, and achieves the ends. And the teacher, in turn, is extremely careful never to communicate anything uh, which can possibly result in further complications for the disciple. He will not tell the disciple more than the disciple can use. The moment he tells him too much, he will abuse. The moment he tells him something not understood, the disciple will misunderstand. So that it all begins with a very simple, gentle method of instruction such as you use with a child that you learn that they teach the child its alphabets first, that to teach the child the simple lessons of daily conduct, because discipleship is another kind of childhood. It is a growing up in grace rather than in body. It is a growing up in insights and in understanding rather than in physical form alone. But every disciple starts a new infancy when he puts his feet upon the path that leads to enlightenment. He becomes again as a little child, growing up in a different kind of world, learning a different kind of lesson, and coming in the end to a mature and, and completely satisfying realization of values. Until this is accomplished, the discipleship is not complete. So that with uh, thoughtful persons who have already advanced somewhat in these matters, a discipleship can be set up by the individual himself. He can be a disciple to his own integrity. He can be a, a disciple to the enlarging vision of his own inner life. He can follow the rules and laws which he has set down for himself as being necessary to his own salvation. <coughs> These things can all be accomplished, and the individual will grow naturally and simply and honestly, and there will be no strange mysteries, no fantastic phenomena associated with it. It will be a simple growth, day by day, uh, toward the light. And in the course of a lifetime, this goes a long way. And the moment the individual really gets his, himself into the pattern of things, he will never leave that pattern. And though he may require many embodiments to complete it, once he puts his feet upon the path, makes his dedication to his own higher self, he will continue to grow until the final desired end is achieved. This is absolutely part of the plan and is invariable. Well, I think that's all for this morning, folks. Thank you very much.